I thought I would start by just sharing a little bit of my story uh, as a prelude to this introduction to StoryCorps. By the way, how many people in here know StoryCorps? Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and those of you who don't, you're going to get to know us really well here. Um, you know, my journey to StoryCorps has a lot to do with my parents, and so I'm going to just start talking about my parents for a second. Um, you know, when I think about this, this, my career in journalism, the one story I've really not seen, a representation I've never seen, was the story of my parents. Uh, my mother uh, was from Japan. Um, my dad was a soldier, and so they met in Japan. And when I think about probably one of the best storytellers who actually never told the stories but had a million stories in her head, it was my mother. Um, she, you know, many people thought she didn't uh, speak English because she spoke with an accent. And so they would say all kinds of stuff around her, right? And they would reveal all kinds of things to her. And here was this woman who, you know, was a professional in Japan before uh, she and my dad met, um, you know, who my dad retired in the middle of Kansas, in for, uh, Salina, Kansas. And so my mom found a way to create Japan in Kansas. Uh, you know, she got Japanese satellite TV, she imported her food, uh, so we always grew up, we had the best culinary house, my dad's from Louisiana, so, you know, we had Japanese food and food from New Orleans and they both were amazing cooks. Um, but she was always somebody who was so, uh, I think, underappreciated and unseen through so much of her life. And even among, uh, you know, the, the women who married soldiers, there was always a little bit of a division between those who married black soldiers, which was my mother, and white soldiers, which were many of her friends. And so even those divisions existed in spaces like that. And when she died, um, I, we were, I opened a drawer, and there were all these little slivers of paper with English words written on them. Uh, and that was my mom's original flashcards. That's how she taught herself English. And so I think, you know, when I think about the effort that she made um, and often did not get that in return, I think of my mom, but she was the most zen, amazing person you would, you would know um, and never revealed the stories of all the people who were talking stuff around her. Um, my dad, you know, was a career military guy and really going into the military was what made possible the lives for all of us kids. Uh, there were four of us, and you know, here was somebody who raised a flag in front of our house every day, uh, who wore his purple heart hat every day. Uh, us idiot kids would always try to get him to wear a Nike hat or an Adidas hat, having zero understanding of what it really meant to wear a purple heart hat. Uh, and so if I had a StoryCorps interview with my dad, um, I would say I was sorry and ask for his forgiveness for that. Um, because when I think about this person who, you know, served our country so nobly, um, when the country didn't exactly love him back, but you didn't know it, uh, that was my dad, right? And when he died, again, we're in the middle of Kansas, when he died, all these women, mostly white women, frankly, came up to us and said, your dad saved my marriage. Your dad saved our family. Because when he retired, he became a mall walker, and he would walk through the mall every single day. People would look out for him. And what we didn't know was the reason he was gone three and four hours a day was because people were coming out and telling him all of their problems and their stories, and he was counseling them. So the idea that here I am at a listening organization, which is StoryCorps, I think that also comes from my dad. Can you hear me okay? I'm hearing a little bit of, yeah, okay. Um, that, com that comes from my dad. Um, so when, I, when StoryCorps reached out to me at the end of last year, um, you know, I, I had had other difficult um, opportunities. I had had other, other opportunities to go to, to many places, um, especially since, you know, after, after the murder of George Floyd, everybody was looking for a black leader, right? So people were coming after me all the time. Headhunters were everywhere. But for me, you know, in the last five, six years of my career has been about intention. And it is about, you know, thinking more, more thoughtfully because so much of my journey has been unplanned, um, unintentional. Uh, it was really thinking about also what nourishes me. 
And, and I think sometimes as leaders, we don't give ourselves that grace to think about that. You know, we're thinking about service, which is a wonderful thing to do, but your, your service is as only good as who you are and how tall you're standing. And so, you know, I was having these, these little epiphanies. Um, one step from the top, as I was telling Chad earlier, one step from the top at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I felt as empty as I could ever feel, right? I, I, I was wondering, like, well, you know, we've got all these layoffs and buyouts, I've been, you know, sending people on their way at, at the height of their career. Uh, you know, we're in a volume-driven space just pumping out content all day long. But where are the people? And I realized in that epiphany when I was thinking of leaving journalism, uh, what I really wanted it to be was closer to community and closer to people. Um, I went to WHYY where I was able to do that, and that's the NPR station here in Philadelphia. Uh, for those of you who are public media geeks, that's the station of Terry Gross, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and I learned everything I, I needed to know about nonprofit work, but also it gave me a chance to work every day with communities and, and break down barriers, particularly between communities of color and news organizations. And so that was the work that we, we did. And where, when I was at the Philadelphia Inquirer, my t I had no timeline. At WHYY, I had a timeline like, oh, hell no. No more marathon, let's sprint, right? And so we were able to do a lot of good work there. So when StoryCorps came calling, the first thing I thought of was my parents. And it was like, this is meant to be. Um, for those of you who don't know StoryCorps, and even those of you who do, because I know you hear StoryCorps stories from regular people um, every, every Friday on, across the country on NPR stations, we actually do have StoryCorps tissues because many of these stories uh, make you cry, make you have to pull over, because I think the thing, there's this activation that happens when you hear stories from everyday people that are sharing their wisdom with us there's something so moving about that, right? The generosity, the beauty, the poetry of so many of these stories. And some of these are hard stories. And I'm going to just warn you, I'm going to take you through a few of these hard stories today, but I'll bring you back up again. Uh, but this is real life. Um, and, and these are through the voices of regular people. So in 2005, little history and story core. Um, you know, next year, I think we're going to be, well, I guess, what, what year are we in now, <laughs> right? 2022, uh, yeah. So we're our, actually in 2003, Dave Isay, the founder of StoryCorps, he, he basically took this, this booth. He was a documentarian, uh, audio documentarian. He put this booth in Grand Central Terminal. And basically it was like inviting people to come in with someone they loved, someone whose story they wanted to honor, uh, to talk for 40 minutes. 40 minutes about whatever they wanted to talk about. And in the beginning, um, you know, there were hardly any signups, right? And one woman who really got it from the beginning, an early adopter came like 200 times, like she's bringing people off the subway and everybody she knows, and like, come on, let's have a conversation in the StoryCorps booth. And eventually it ended up catching on with a StoryCorps facilitator there whose job, for the most part, is to listen. Uh, it's not to moderate the conversation, but it's to, you know, to help folks along if they need it. But most people come in with such an intent to talk to each other. Um, a few years later, they added a story called Tormobile, which is an airstream that crosses the country and has been to every state in the United States and continues to do so. In fact, I just left our, 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 our tour in Montana. And they go in, they're working with many nonprofit partners, uh, as well as public media stations to get folks to sign up. And people come in and tell the most incredible stories. Uh, the one I heard uh, in Montana, the first story I heard in Missoula was these, this white couple comes in and I'm thinking, well, you know, they're in their 70s. I mean, they're probably gonna talk about their kids, their grandkids. She was the daughter of a pastor. Um, and in every church that he led, uh, he was fired from every single time because he showed support for black people. So when she brought her black friend to church and their dad said, introduce your friend, they, it was just a matter of time. Uh, when they invited black musicians to stay at their house instead of the broken down uh, hotel where they were the only place they were allowed to stay, it was just a matter of time. And every time they had to move on, um, you know, the, her mother had to build a new church family, they had to meet new friends, and the father had to win over another congregation. Talk about your unexpected stories. You, you would never hear that story 
in most places. So I'm going to share a little bit of story. Is somebody advancing this for me? Oh, I'm advancing it myself. Well, that's not a good idea. Um, let me see. Can I? Good? Oh, I, that's, these are just some of the stories, right? Um, regular people coming in uh, to talk to StoryCorps about what's happening in their lives. Um, it's such a range, you know. We don't tell people what to talk about. We don't ask them to respond to news events. We say, what do you want to talk about? And they come into our booth. Up to now, uh, we have uh, captured almost 700,000 stories. And so it is the largest collection of human voices of regular, uh, regular people, and we continue to do so. Yes. Oh, oh sure. Okay, yeah, sure. I love Karen because she knows I'm a, I have to move around. Okay, I appreciate that. All right. So, oh, was I doing? Okay. So what I stuck in here uh, in between these segments were just little lessons, I think, that all you know, apply to us as human beings, but also as leaders. And leaders who are dealing with things in a really difficult time, when there's a lot of unrest in our country, not the first time, a lot of unrest, but also I think for many of us, we have an unrest in ourselves that can either make us really weary or draw out the best in us, too. Yeah. Tears already. I see. <laughs> well, your work is what you leave behind at the end of a lifetime. You know, what can I say? Um, you know, this next piece, and this is, this is, well, you know, when the school shooting at Uvalde happened, um, I immediately thought of this story because Sometimes we think we know what the story is and we know the full extent of the story. And sometimes as we listen and we talk to each other, we actually hear other things that take us into a more understanding uh, place. And so this was a conversation um, between a mother and son. And, um, you know, this is, I just wanted to get... Um, Desmond Floyd, when he was 10 years old, came to StoryCorps with his mother, Tania Bernard Turner, to talk about what goes through his mind. Um, what was increasingly becoming normal, right? Active shooter drills in schools. And this was, when we think this was in 2018, think of how many drills that have happened in between then and now, and also how many mass shootings have happened between then and now, right? You know, before anything, I'm a mom too. And, you know, this gets me every single time. Um, you know, we have gotten so desensitized and so used to this stuff. And this is what we signed up for, right? Is that now these, ju these drills are so commonplace that uh, we don't even talk about them anymore. And, um, and a 10-year-old should not have to make those kind of choices. And a 10-year-old is showing more character than so many people that we know uh, these days. So, uh, And again, you know, I just want to remind you all that, um, you know, in the animation, sometimes we forget these are real people. These are the people who come into our booths. These are the ones who are having these conversations. And so uh, we could write a million stories about shootings and drills and all these other things, but I think this brings it brings what we, the choice that has been made for this country to bear right now. Um, Miss Betty's uh, calling. So, you know, in the mid-1980s, uh, Miss Betty Thompson, she retired from her job in state government, and she started a second career working at the Jackson Women's Health Organization as a counselor, the clinic that is the, was the center of the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. And by 2000, um, by 2004, it was the only remaining abortion clinic in Mississippi. And in 2006, Ms. Betty came to StoryCorps to share her story. You know, we, we consider these stories from everyday people completely sacred. And we wanted to re-release this story, um, you know, as the, the decision was being made. Uh, and so we always ask permission. You know, we're not putting anybody out there uh, without their permission. And she thought it was important enough for her to come share the story, and she allowed us to share it again. And one of the things that StoryCorps has been doing over the last couple of years, uh, recognizing the toxic polarization in this country. I mean, think about it. 
you know, surveys show, you know, half, the, half, half of either party would feel better if the other side was dead, literally dead, right? Um, uh, I just saw uh, uh, some data the other day which showed most people think we're headed for a civil war, could be, right? And when we think of the billion dollar or more, um, you know, really, you know, toxic polarization complex that is out there that, you know, is feeding things on social media and is making sure people feel we're more divided than we really are. And of course, I must admit, as a, as a journalist, the story is always where the division is. The story is not the people in the middle who really want to kind of, you know, figure out how we come together. Um, so we started a couple of years ago this project called One Small Step. And what we do is this, we bring together people from differing political parties, different, different political views, but we don't have the conversation about politics. We start the conversation uh, with folks getting to know each other first. We ask them for a bio, uh, they write their bio, we look for one piece of commonality they have. They might have just gotten divorced, they might be veterans, uh, you know, they might have grandkids. We just look for that one little thread. Um, and they come together in a, in a facilitated conversation uh, first to talk about each other, right? And so they start off reading a bio of the other person to try to create a space of respectability. And, and, and these are people who sign up for this. I mean, we've got a waiting list of about 10,000 people right now who, who, who want to be interviewed. And where we're playing is not on the extremes where there's really no point in, in really trying to, <laughs> trying to do this work, but the exhausted middle, where there's way more people who would like to understand and come to some, some conversation with each other than ever will be reported in the media and ever will get the light of day. Um, and so this next piece I'm gonna show you, it actually wasn't um, something that was with, with one small step in the original, in the framework that we have now, but this was um, a college student, a Muslim college student, who um, ended up kind of having a chance encounter and experience with, um, a white, recently laid off a uh, sheet metal worker. And, um, and you'll kind of see sort of how they ended up intersecting in a way that they never would have expected. And this was at a Trump rally. He was there in his red Make America Great hat, and she was there protesting um, Trump. Okay. So to be clear, we're not trying to put a nice bow on some really difficult issues. But, you know, if we it can't see each other as human beings to start off with, and there's no hope at all. Uh, and so StoryCorps is in the business of connection and, and hope, ultimately. And I would like to believe that after that conversation, um, there were some other transformations that at least were possible to happen. Um, so I'm going to close with um, this piece, uh, which is, is a piece of hope but emotion. Um, Nine-year-old Aiden Sykes came to StoryCorps in Jackson, Mississippi to ask his father, Albert, a few important questions. Do you remember what was going through your head when you first saw me? I remember when the doctor pulled you out. The first thing I thought was that he was being too rough with you. And he actually held you like a little Sprite bottle. And he was like, here's your baby. That was the most proud moment of my life. Don't tell your brothers, because it's three of y'all. But it was like looking at a blank canvas and just imagining what you want their painting to look like at the end, but also knowing you can't control the paint strokes. You know, the fear was just, I got to bring up a black boy in Mississippi, which is a tough place to bring up kids, period. But there are statistics that say black boys born after the year 2002 have a one in three chance of going to prison. And all three of my sons were born after the year 2002. So dad, why do you take me to protest so much? <laughs> I think I take you for a bunch of reasons. One is that I want you to see what it looks like when people come together. But also that you understand that it's not just about people that are familiar to you, but it's about everybody. Did you know the work that Martin Luther King was doing was for everybody and it wasn't just for black people? 
Yes, I understand that. Yeah. And so that's how you got to think. If you decide that you want to be a cab driver, then you got to be the most impactful cab driver that you can possibly be. Are you proud of me? Of course. You my man. I, I just love everything about you, period. The thing I love about you, you never give up on me. That's one of the things I will always remember by my dad. Uh, you said it like I'm on the way out of here or like I'm already gone. So, Dad, what are your dreams for me? My dream is for you to live out your dreams. It's an old proverb that talks about when children are born, children come out with their fists closed because that's where they keep all their gifts. And as you grow, your hands learn to unfold because you're learning to release your gifts to the world. And so for the rest of your life, I want to see you live with your hands unfolded. Okay, everybody, do this, do this. Um, you know, I know leadership is not always easy. Um, you know, I know that there's a lot of self-reflection that happens in it, maybe not enough self-reflection sometimes. Uh, you know, there's an expectation of leaders that is very different these days, uh, and sometimes we don't know which way to go. Um, but, I, you know, I could just see the commitment in this room, and so my wish for you is that you lead with your hands unfolded, right? Um, you know, I know sometimes leadership can feel like this, where your hands are clenched all the time, right? Um, but remember your gifts, uh, and not just your gifts, but the gifts of the people that you work with. And so as you release your gifts, the gifts of others will also release too. And so that message is to all of us. Um, that was it. I, I, I have a bonus one after the Q&A just to take us out happy, but um, although that was about as inspirational as you can get. Um, any, am I doing Q&A? Where's, where's Karen? Is, is there a Q&A or are we done? Oh, you're asking a journalist if I want a Q&A? No, uh, no, no, seriously, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes, go ahead. Well, you know, these are 40-minute interviews, and so I think, yeah, I think what we, what we, you know, you actually connect before people even come in the booth. I mean, having witnessed this and seeing kind of how the facilitators do so much work before someone even comes into the booth, and people come so ready to tell their stories, right? Um, and so as they get into the booth, you're listening for nuggets, right? You're listening for, for wisdom, you're listening for personality, Oh, how do we find them? Oh, I'm sorry, how do we find them? How do we find uh, the people? As we go into cities uh, and the, the, the Story, StoryCorps mobile booth, which is, you know, this thing, it's like an RV, it's an Airstream that tra travels across the country. Uh, we work with public media stations, but also nonprofits. And so we do a lot of uh, work to make sure that 50% of our um, participants are not people who necessarily hear us through public media, but who are working with organizations. So it could be juvenile justice organizations or arts organizations. Uh, and then usually the signups go really, really quick. I mean, we're there for one month. Um, our facilitators uh, are there in the booth uh, with folks. And right now, because of COVID, we look for spaces like public libraries and other things where we can kind of spread out a little bit more. Um, and, and, you know, we do interviews six days a week, six, six interviews a day. The facilitators say very little. You know, I mean, if people need a little bit of prompting or a little bit of focus, then they might, they might ask questions. At the end of the, um, the interview, um, and most people come into them, you know, and they're, they're, they're crying too, right? I mean, they're, they're just like waiting to share the story and knowing that they have created something that can be archived forever. 99% uh, of them sign the waivers that um, allow us to create these, these stories. Uh, uh, share it, you know, what happens is that they get a copy of it after we get a copy of it for our archives, and if they choose, 
Uh, they can also send it to the archive at the American Folklife Center at the uh, Library of Congress so that their grandchildren, great, 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 can always find, uh, find their, their, their interview. Any other questions? Yes? Oh, the 1%? You know, <clears throat> sometimes I think when people, what's the 1% that doesn't agree to sign the waiver? I don't know, like, but I can guess, right? I mean, sometimes people share things that are so intimate that they start to think like, I don't know, do I really want somebody uh, to, to see that, right? Uh, sometimes people are revealing information. Maybe they haven't revealed to anyone else in their family, but they wanted to talk to, you know, whoever was there with them. Um, so, you know, I mean, we, the thing is, we all know, right, we're in the age where we can capture so much on the phone and we got all these, however, my kid will never find my stuff unless she knows my password. So if I kick tomorrow, all my stuff is lost in my family, right? I mean, this is what makes StoryCorps different is that, you know, this is a sacred space, this is with a facilitator, uh, this stuff is archived and so hopefully, you know, you can find it forever. And we do do some audio cards, uh, for example, you know, some people have died and want to have an audio card made, you know, for their family member, and they're just so beautiful. I mean, you listen to this person talking about their life in a way that no pastor could ever do, right? right. Yes. Oh, wow. Uh, so the question was, in my journalism career, is there anyone I would like to go back to um, uh, for, with a historic interview? Is that what it is? You know, hmm. I mean, immediately what comes to mind, and this is not an interview, this is my, my dad. I shared that story about the, the Purple Heart because I live in such shame, uh, you know, thinking of what this man went through, you know, and he didn't have just one Purple Heart, he had like three, right? Um, and so, and, and after you've been injured once, I, I can't imagine that you, you, you know, Purple Heart's not something you really want to try to get, right? But, but I, think, I think of what he went through, you know, he grew up in Louisiana. He was the only person in his family who was able to really, you know, come out of poverty and he supported so many in his family. And to think that, you know, us rat-ass kids are asking him to take his hat off so that he could wear a Nike hat, you know, it, it hurts me when I think about it. But it also, I think, is, is the thing that tells us we have perspective. As life goes on, we have different perspectives, right? And, um, and we've come to understand things at different points in our lives. By the way, if you want to do a historic interview, we, have an, we just released an update on our app. So you can actually do that, uh, take a photo of the person you're talking to, you can do a StoryCorps interview on the app, and you actually can send it to the Library of Congress if you, if you choose to. So it is accessible, it's one of the things that you know, we really worked on, particularly during the pandemic, to make sure that people could still connect. Sir, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. Is there an area of the country that we really look forward to? I think everyone, honestly, and that sounds like such a hokey thing, but um, you can't make up these stories. And, and you don't even know, you know, the gems uh, that are there. I mean, there's just so much beauty in all of these stories, and we literally learn something every day. Our facilitators are kind of like Peace Corps volunteers. I mean, they get paid, right? But, but <laughs> Yeah, maybe not enough, but they get paid. Uh, and they're traveling across the country, and as a former Peace Corps volunteer, I have a special thing in my heart for, for, for that service, too. Um, but they all leave uh, saying people are basically good, you know. Um, you know, they don't know these communities. They're going into places that, you know, they're not sure what, who's going to meet them where. But what they come out with is always thinking, you know, people are basically good. You know, we don't have it, most of us don't have a chance to see the breadth of our country in that kind of a way. Was there a question in the back? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm curious about how the media offers benefits from these devices yeah. and highlighting the differences we have. Like, how is that different from the media that is not focused on what brings us together as leaders rather than with the Yeah, so the question was, you know, how can 
the public, right? Push the media to be better when we live in spaces of division and, you know, most certainly with TV, it's about, it's about ratings. And most people can't even tell what the journalist is anymore because you've got a mix of TV personalities with other people all mushed together like a mosh pit. Um, you, you know, uh, that's a really hard question to answer because I think, well, no, here's the biggest answer you can get is push for better leadership in these news organizations and support, um, you know, I was at a um, meeting with residents in Germantown here in Philadelphia and I used to take my reporters and editors up into neighborhoods to actually sit with folks and have them look at our stories. And in many cases, what I found was that, you know, people didn't even know we did the story because they're not going to WHYY, right? So, uh, you know, asking for people to come and, and to your community group, I think, is a really good thing. Because one of the things that I have found that every time I've done a, you know, community talk, whether it's been in a synagogue, a church, wherever, um, rec center, is that once people actually see that what stories are happening in the darkness of night that they would never know about uh, had it not been for a journalist? No one, I, I can't assume anyone should know what a journalist does because you never meet one, right? I didn't meet a journalist growing up. So I think the more that we can get out, and I think this is really the responsibility of journalists and newsrooms and leadership, more so than the public uh, demanding that, but you can do that. You know, you can say, you know, I really would like a journalist to come in and uh, explain what do you do and challenge us. I mean, I think that's, that's perfectly okay too. When we were meeting with the residents in Germantown, uh, one of the things that was interesting was one of, one of them stood up and said, why do you always call the same source in our neighborhood every time you call so-and-so? And the reporter was in the room and the reporter's answer was, well, because that person gives really good radio. Like, you know, radio, you want to get to the point real quick and you get that sound bite. And I'm thinking, as, the ed as, as that person's boss, I'm like, oh God, right? <laughs> but um, but the, the source was also in the room. And the, and the source stood up and said, here's why I respond every time a journalist calls me, right? Because I want to make sure we're represented right. And so the more I think we can do that kind of trust building work and the more that leadership rises to where it needs to be, uh, in terms of kind of breaking down some of the, you know, sort of ways that we've done business all along. Uh, we have, as journalists, you know, under, I think, the cloak of objectivity and all these other things, don't get to be real citizens, right? We don't get to join school boards. We don't get to really kind of float in our communities in the ways that most of us would like to. And so I think there's a lot of kind of, of those conversations happening in journalism right now of how can people just see us as human beings too. Any other? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, the question was, most of the stories are in English and there's a few in Spanish and um, that's actually on my list. That's one of my goals. I've been in StoryCorps for five, uh, five months. Um, you know, language unlocks so much, right? And authentic storytelling doesn't all happen in English. And so thanks for the question because that's one of my goals. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs>